Howdy, this is the Amateur Logician from AmateurLogician.com. I sincerely hope you are doing well. In this video, we're going to take a look at some modal logic exercises from the great textbook Introduction to Logic by the late father Harry J. Gensler. This happens to be the third edition of this textbook. It's quite good for a modern contemporary approach to logic, a mathematical symbolic approach. I almost want to say in a manner of speaking that this has a cult-like following based on the software you can download for free that accompanies this textbook where you can work through logic exercises. And perhaps in a future video, we'll look at that. It's pretty cool. I'll provide a link below. But let's get ready to prepare the way. I have some notes here. Some of them are based on Father Gensler's textbook. Others are based on my own recollection, so to speak. These will help prepare us to do the exercises. I also review the reductio ad absurdum proof technique, which is very powerful and will come in handy with all of these arguments, all of these examples. Now, these example problems are from Gensler's textbook, and they're a perfect illustration that logic is not about just manipulating arbitrary symbols. We're going to look into real-world arguments, for example, from pages 239 to 240. So we're going to get back to the textbook and take a look at it. And then we'll jump into some exercises. So Gensler's book is really good, Introduction to Logic. I really like it. I have other videos on this book, in fact. So this covers the standard topics, syllogistic logic, a.k.a. categorical logic. It gets into logical fallacies and inductive reasoning. Then you have classic symbolic logic with propositional logic and predicate logic. And then for our purposes, most importantly, advanced symbolic systems, part three, where chapter 10 is on basic modal logic, which is what we will be talking about and doing some exercises from. So let's jump to chapter 10, and I want to very briefly talk about the exercises. As you can see, these exercises are not a bunch of math problems with math symbols. These are concrete, philosophical, interesting, unique arguments to analyze. Now, we will translate them into propositional logic, into modal logic, into that mathematical symbolism, and then apply the rules of inference to derive the conclusion for sure. But this is not just a math game. So chapter 10, basic modal logic. 10.1 is on translations, where we talk about the diamond symbol and the box symbol, which is essential in modal logic. And it's a readable book, so I definitely think you can self-study from it. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, simple necessity, conditional necessity in a minute. Here we have uh, translation exercises, so that's pretty important. Then we get into actual proofs with 10.2 using rules of inference. Now, my approach to doing these proofs will be slightly and only slightly different than Gensler's. It's going to be more in line with other videos, which I think is a better thing to do. It's totally compatible with what Gensler does, but I just want you to, to know it is a little bit different. But let's get into the notes. So we're going to begin here with the diamond and the box. And I have other videos that go into this in more depth. We're going to go relatively quick here. So diamond P, it's possible that P. P is true in some possible world. P alone just means it's true that P. P is true in the actual world. And box P is necessary that P. P is true in all possible worlds. It's a necessary truth. In the book, Father Gensler talks about simple necessity versus conditional necessity. So note P arrow box Q versus box parentheses P arrow Q close parentheses. Consider if you are a bachelor, then you are unmarried. The second proposition is obviously true. It's necessary that if you are a bachelor, then you are unmarried. Well, clearly that's true. But the first proposition is not obviously true. In most cases, it's false. If you're a bachelor, then you are inherently unmarriable. In other words, there's no possible world where anyone would marry you. But that's not going to be true. So the placement of that box makes a difference. Let's think about some rules of inference when it comes to modal logic in particular. So the first thing, we have modal negation. And the second thing, we have modal reflexivity. So with modal negation, we're thinking about logical equivalencies. Not box P is logically equivalent to diamond not P. Observe the change in location of the negation symbol and the change from box to diamond. We have it's false that P is necessary is equivalent to it is possible that P is false. With the second pair of propositions, we have it's false that P is possible is equivalent to it is necessary that P is false. In proofs, we often have to move from that left-hand side to that right-hand side, so to speak. 
with modal reflexivity, we really have an axiom. From box P, we can get if box P, then P. A modus ponens inference in propositional logic will allow us, therefore, to get P. From box P, we can get a P. We're going to be utilizing these in our proofs, and I have other videos that go into more depth if you need it. So then we have the reductio ad absurdum, which I also have a lot of videos on. There's also a dedicated page on my website on the reductio ad absurdum. So we start with some premises, p sub 1 to p sub n, make an assumption, then derive some derivations using rules of inference from that assumption, but we end up with a contradiction, such as d and not d. That's a contradiction. So that implies that proposition A cannot be the case, okay? So in other words, we can get a not A. A leads to a contradiction, but because a contradiction cannot be true, that means A cannot be true. Or in other words, not A is true. A reductio ad absurdum proof is also called an indirect proof. It's one of the most interesting proof techniques in all of logic and is very important in philosophy, in logic, in mathematics. So now we're going to be jumping into some arguments, a couple of arguments from Gensler's textbook. My advice is if you are comfortable with some propositional logic and modal logic, pause the video and try these yourself. Think about the argument, symbolize them into propositional and modal logic, and derive the proof step by step. Number four, there's a perfect God. There's evil in this world. Therefore, there's a perfect God is logically compatible with there's evil in this world. Premise G. There is a perfect God. Premise E, there is evil in this world. Conclusion, it's necessary both G and E. We are going to do a reductio ad absurdum proof. So we're going to start with the assumption of not diamond both G and E, and then do a modal negation, hence box not both G and E. And from there, we can use modal reflexivity. And I made a mistake with the number there. It's not five, it's four. We get box not both G and E, arrow, not both G and E, and then we can do a modus ponens, okay, to get not both G and E, modus ponens 5 and 4. With the negation of a conjunction, we can then use De Morgan's Law to get not G or not E, De Morgan's Law, line 6. We're getting close to finding that contradiction. For line 8, we can get not not G by the double negation of line 1. A disjunctive syllogism is staring us in the face with lines 7 and 8. Not G or not E, not not G, therefore not E. And so for line 10, we can get E and not E by conjunction of lines 2 and 9, but that's a contradiction. So that assumption must be false. So not not, diamond, both G and E by the reductio ad absurdum proof, lines 3 to 10. So our final conclusion is that diamond, both G and E by the double negation of line 11, so that concludes that proof. This textbook has a lot of other exercises like this. It's definitely something you can self-study with and learn some logic. There's lots of interesting arguments like this, so I think this is definitely a worthwhile textbook. I wanted to change things up a little bit and work on problem number eight, so we're going to do that. This is, again, from the textbook. The argument is, God brings it about that you do A is inconsistent with you freely do A. God brings it about that you freely do A entails God brings it about that you do A. God brings it about that you freely do A entails you freely do A. Conclusion, therefore, it's impossible for God to bring it about that you freely do A. Translating this argument is a bit tricky. Here's a few hints. For example, the first premise with the inconsistency is telling us we have it is not possible, so a not diamond. And the other two premises, the entails tells us we have conditionals, but also that these are necessary statements. Okay, so we have that box. So here is our argument. Premise one, not diamond, parentheses, B and F, close parentheses, where B stands for God brings it about that you do A, and F stands for you freely do A. Premise two is box parentheses G arrow B, close parentheses. We have the conditional if G then B, where G stands for God brings it about that you freely do A, 
And B, again, stands for God brings it about that you do A. Premise three is box parentheses, G, arrow, F, close parentheses. In other words, it is necessary that if God brings it about that you freely do A, then you freely do A. And our conclusion is, therefore, not diamond G. In other words, it's impossible for God to bring it about that you freely do A. So now we're going to construct our proof using the tools of modal logic and propositional logic. We're doing a reductio ad absurdum proof, so our assumption is going to contradict the conclusion we wish to prove. So the contradictory of not diamond G is just diamond G. And then we'll do a modal negation of line 1 to get box, not both B and F. And then we're going to do modal reflexivity on line 4. So that will get us diamond G, arrow G. Okay. So note that we do have that diamond G. So we can do a modus ponens inference for line 7 to get a G. Again, by modus ponens with line 6 and 4. For line 8, we're going to work with line 2, dealing with modal reflexivity to get a box, parentheses, G, arrow, B, close parentheses, arrow, parentheses, G, arrow, B, close parentheses. So then we could actually work with that, so to speak. So for line 9, we can do our modus ponens inference with lines 8 and 2 to get if G, then B. For line 10, we can then get a B from another modus ponens inference with lines 9 and 7. So note that we do have that G there to then get our B. For line 11, we'll use modal reflexivity on line 3 to get box, parentheses, G, arrow, F, close parentheses, arrow, parentheses, G, arrow, F, close parentheses. Doing that explicitly allows us to get the next line, G, arrow, F, if G, then F, because we have a legitimate modus ponens inference with lines 11 and 3. And then we could do another modus ponens inference because we have a line 12 and we have a line 7 to get that F. And then I'm going to try to continue this proof and arrange these papers, hopefully in a decent manner. Okay, so we have line 14, but that's going to be with what? Modal reflexivity, I think, on line 5. So we're going to recall what line 5 was there. So there is line 5, so we're using modal reflexivity on that. Um, so we can get box, not both B and F, arrow, not both B and F. That's modal reflexivity from line 5. And then we can do our modus ponens inference just to get that not both B and F. So that's modus ponens, lines 14 which we just arrived, and that line 5, which we, uh, previously, we previously looked at. Notice that we now have a negation of a conjunction, and that actually implies that we can apply De Morgan's law here. Okay, so that's what we're going to, we're going to do here. Hence, for line 16, we can get not B or not F via De Morgan with line 15. A disjunctive syllogism will be possible, but first, to be explicit about this, we can get not not B by double negation with line 10 there. So 10 we have B, so we can get not not B. And then for line 18, we can get not F because we have a disjunctive syllogism with 16 and 17. Not B or not F, not not B, therefore not F. And then for 19, we can combine lines 13 and 18 to get F and not F via the conjunction rule. But that's a contradiction. Contradictions cannot be true. And so we have completed our proof of not diamond G by the reductio ad absurdum argument. There are obviously many more exercises to be found in this textbook by the late Father Gensler. And I have a link below that you can use if you wish to purchase this textbook, which I highly recommend. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more videos like this where I work through exercises from this textbook or others, please let me know in the comment section below. Please consider buying me a cup of coffee to support my work because this does take some time. And visit my website at amateurlogician.com. You will find an extensive tutorial on traditional verbal style logic. There are many book recommendations there. I also have some really cool articles on logical fallacies and more. 
So check out my website at amateurlogician.com. I would appreciate it, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Good luck to you, and be well.